Uh, we have an amazing panel discussion for you about CS in education. And now I'll not take any more of your time. I'll hand over the stage to our amazing panelists and our moderator, Nofal Ibrahim. Thanks, Nikhil. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's kind of weird for me to talk in front of a screen rather than a stage, but uh, I guess this is where we're doing it. So thanks for joining the panel. So, hello everyone. It's kind of weird for me to talk in front of a screen rather than a stage, but uh, I guess that's what we're doing. So, thanks for joining the panel. Yeah, so I'll just say Python's history involves an initiative so, called CP4E, right? Computer Programming for Everyone. This was like back when Python was originally there. It was a DARPA funded project. And some of the early tools like IDLE and everything were developed as part of that effort. Okay, This project was discontinued, but yeah, Python's so roots are intertwined with CS education. Okay. While the language has changed significantly since those days, it's still being used as a language to teach programming. It was a DARPA-funded project. And some of the early tools like IDLE and everything were developed as part of that effort. So arguably, PyCon itself is an exercise in education. And the language has changed significantly since those days. It's still being used as a language to teach programs. PyCon itself is an exercise in education where the larger community gathers, albeit virtually now, and learns from each other. So this year, we are happy to be able to present so four distinguished speakers who have been active in different ways in CS education and to get their perspectives uh, on the Hi, hi no, Phil. Uh, I'm sorry for uh, interrupting you. But I think yeah. someone has the stream open in the background. There is some echo. Larger community gathers, albeit virtually. Is it? gone now i think it's clear now uh, yeah i think it's clear so yeah, please i think it's there. my bad sorry okay <clears throat> all right so i'm sorry about that so i'll just uh, start off by introducing the speakers first okay, first i'll uh, introduce dr prabhu he's an associate professor of aerospace engineering at iit bombay he's a python prog programmer and a big contributor in the scientific python suite developer of maya v and other projects He's also been associated with PyCon since the first one, and he was our first keynote speaker in 2009 when we were a very small affair. Second, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Sri Ram Krishnamurthy. He's a professor of computer science at Brown University, recipient of SIGPLAN's uh, Robin Milner Young Researcher Award, SIGSoft's Influential Educator Award, SIGPLAN's Software Award jointly, and Brown University's uh, uh, Riston Fellowship. And he's joining us from across the globe, so special thanks for that. Third, I'd like to introduce Ambiga Joshi. She's the co-founder of Ajebgar, a management and strategy, strategy consultancy for museums and culture projects. Under the moniker Computational Mama, she has been learning and teaching creative coding over the past three years. She's also a co-instigator of Draw.ft, Draw which explores emergent ideas of text draft, and draft. its future. Draft. draft. OK, maybe. Sorry. And finally, I'd like to introduce Pramod. Uh, who's a computer programmer from Kerala? Who's uh, uh, he's currently working at a develop as a developer with a company building a networking product. He has been providing training and consulting on GNU Linux and related technologies since '97. Promote started blogging at the time when Live Journal was still a thing. I don't know if anyone's even heard of it, but okay. many of those posts back on the blog document the uh, activity of the software community in open source and free software community in Kerala back in those days. Okay. And me, myself, my name is Naufal. Uh, I've been involved with PyCon since the early days. I was the founder of the first edition of the conference. And uh, I'm still into programming. I've been running my own company now. And that's basically about me. All right. So uh, let's get started. The way I'm planning this is initially to ask a few general questions to the panelists as a whole. That you can, anyone can pick them up and answer it. We'll do that for around 10 minutes. All right. And then uh, that should give us sufficient uh, background for the audience questions. I want this to be become more interactive, right? So more people can ask questions. I mean, I don't want to just interview everyone over here and say we're done. So this, these questions should hopefully give us some uh, context so that people can actually pitch in with their questions and then the panelists can answer them. Right? So with that, uh, I have a questions prepared being, so that we don't, uh, it's somewhat structured. So 
the idea of programming right and cs education has changed over the years right become from once when it was a specialist thing and something which only geeks and nerds did till now it's become much more widespread okay so the question i'd like to ask all of you from your own perspective is how important is the ability to code okay and perhaps also to how to you know the ability to think like a programmer for a normal person and for a non cs professional have the boundaries between programming and you know non programming been blurred over the years it's an open question so anyone can pick it up sure i'll lead off absolutely yes those boundaries have been blurred um uh you know i we we could all here sit here and use the phrase computing is the new literacy etc uh i think the main thing is we need a little caution about what we mean by saying computing is the new literacy right we throw this phrase around but literacy is a sort of you know as a phenomenon of course you can approach it many levels there's the person who can just about sign their name versus the person who can actually read you know a great work of literature right or write a great work of literature the question i think we have to ask is not is the line blurred yes absolutely it is do people benefit from it at large many many people will the real question is does a small amount of exposure help everybody and i think that's actually a very questionable proposition right that this tiny amount of exposure is somehow immensely beneficial and carries over in all sorts of ways i think it's controversial so i'll say i'll leave it there and then let other people speak now that's a good point i mean it's, it's a question of quantity as much as quality there right so mm -hmm. any other thoughts on the same thread so i i think i think we, we should order. yeah please Please, please, continue. Sriram, Pramod, Vikan, and I can go last. So. No, that's okay. Pramod, you can please. Oh, okay, fine. Um, yeah, so I agree uh, from the perspective of. Uh, so I'm going to look at it purely from an engineering point of view, from an engineer's point of view, uh, non-CS engineers. Uh, is uh, I feel yes, it's it's become something that is sufficiently important that I feel everyone should have some exposure to it. but exactly what that exposure is is something that at least i have a strong opinion on some things but uh, it's certainly something that is important to me it's 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 no longer a subject that is an option it i mean everyone whether you're doing uh, you know biology or you're doing mainstream engineering you're doing the sciences uh, or you're doing math all of these are going to involve some amount of computation unless you're one of the rare individuals who only works with pen and paper which is a very small subset um so in practice i feel that certainly an exposure uh, i'm just building on what sridam is saying uh, which is an exposure is important uh, how much exposure what exact exposure that's a separate question so i i, I think going down that path is you know we're going to end up with a emax versus vim versus whatever else so, um there's a lot but I, there are two things in particular that are important in that uh, along that uh, path one is uh, it's not just about programming it's also about thinking computationally uh, and this applies across the board in each of the fields that you talk about because a lot of things that people learn uh, it's clear to me at least personally and from students that i have observed that you tend to learn some of even the theoretical subjects much better when you do uh, and a lot of them are easy to do with a computer so um, Uh, in particular some of the uh, things that you know pramod and uh, dr rajit have done all of these are very important because they allow you to you know mix programming along with some scientific concept or some engineering concept along with electronics and putting it together in an interesting way um this completely changes things because it's no longer pen and paper it's no longer either theorem proving it's no longer understanding some conservation laws uh, so this actually changes the game in a significant way so i think it's both a tool uh it's something that you need to learn as a tool and you also need to learn how to think computationally so it's it's a very powerful way of approaching a problem so i think that's an important skill it's like it's kind of like mathematics is. so that's my take on okay so uh i i uh, that that actually sort of dovetails into something else which i had in mind this idea of teaching young children and i'm using the term loosely okay when i say young children young children programming right 
it's divisive. The, so on, on one hand, the people who are somewhat forward thinking about it and who say, like, you know, the more kids experience this when early in school, etc., they will actually benefit from this in the long term professionally and otherwise. There are other parents who say that, you know, no nonsense. We don't want kids to sit in front of the screen all day. We don't want them to use mobile devices. They should be go out and, you know, scraping their knees and playing football or whatever. So and and the thing is this thing about educating kids on these kinds of subjects has been the reason for companies you know a lot of these ed tech companies that are coming up also so it's not insignificant there is a significant uh, thing over there so what do you have uh, you know do you have any thoughts on that like you know when do we start this when do we start like you know from birth high school uh, you know uh, primary school high school perhaps early college you know any any thoughts on that? Can I, I, just can like I take this one? That. Oh, yes, please do. Uh, so uh, unlike the other uh, other folks on the panel, I only started learning coding as a as a fully grown adult and professional. And it actually started when I was expecting my son about three years ago. Uh, so in a sense, uh, what I understood and uh, my background as a maker made me understand this better is that the idea is that programming like any other kind of making is important for children but whether one needs to kind of push it through that whole uh, the cs education new kind of unicorn sector that we have where you know uh, auto rickshaw drivers are taking loans to make their kids uh, study in these uh, in these modules whether that makes sense I i'm not certain uh, but uh, in general uh, many of uh, many of uh, my friends who who are in programming as professionals of uh, of the senior level have come into it as people who wanted to make something and they found that the most exciting aspect of coding and prabhu also mentioned that in in his reference so per perhaps that is an interesting way to look at it rather than um, like uh, putting it into that whole idea that it needs to be a language just like learning uh, English or Hindi, Kannada, you know, Tamil, whatever else uh, you may be speaking at home. So it's it's just like 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 you learn how to use a paper or a pen or and you learn how to fold paper or, or fold your clothes even. Maybe now you need to learn how to, you know, understand that idea of computational thinking and programming. I mean, the, this That's, conversation is a little hard to have, right? Like the first thing we have to acknowledge is that it's completely driven by like middle class concerns about economic security, right? The problem is the fact that it's driven by them doesn't mean that the solutions are actually going to address those concerns, right? The concerns are legitimate. There's no question. Everyone's worried about how their kid's going to be. Are their children going to be better off than they are, et cetera. Those are legitimate concerns. Parents, everyone has those. Right? But it's not at all clear to me that the solutions have anything to do with the problem. Right? And at least in India, for instance, I mean, it's kind of amazing to me to watch the Indian space a little bit from afar. It's astounding. I'm not going to name any companies here, but I think we all know the companies we're talking about. Like we all, we all watch cricket, so we all know what's on the jerseys. Right? So it's astounding the amount of mind space and the amount of like, like energy these, these companies have sucked up with no opposing voices because the opposing voices don't have the marketing, you know, the marketing news to pull it off. Right. I think that the, we have very little evidence. So part of the thing is I'm also a computer science researcher. I'm not only an outreach person. I don't only educate. I also do research and I also read the research literature. Now, to some extent, to be fair, the area is young enough that we can't say very much. OK. On the other hand, we have only pretty slim evidence that starting at a really early age actually matters much. Right. Um, my own, a lot of my outreach work in the past 12 years is focused on mid, middle school. So middle school is like secondary school, like ages about 10 through 14, something like that, right? In fact, usually we say around 12, right? Because there's a point at which children have a certain degree of other kinds of literacy already, and we can build on those kinds of literacies, and then we can try to achieve new things. They know a little bit of mathematics, they know a little bit of reading and writing, and we can build on top of those to achieve new things. Trying to put computing in before that point, before they've achieved a very basic level of other kinds of literacy, 100 years from now, it may very well be we'll look at this and say, like, of course, that's the right thing to do. What were these people thinking? Like, Sherman was a complete idiot, right? But right now, I don't think we have the mechanisms, the tools, the questions, the ideas. We don't have those things, and we're rushing in. So I think the only thing I would say is, like, it's OK. You can chill out. Right? It's okay to wait till your child is at least in middle school before you start this thing. It's the the you know the race the race can still be won if that's how you want to think about it. Uh, 
Okay, I think I think that makes sense. Uh, just moving a little bit ahead in time for this. Now, one of the other conversations that's been happening in India, uh, specific to this, is the whole skill gap problem. Like you have uh, like large number of people who are getting uh, bachelor's degrees in engineering, computer science, and who can't code, who can't, who can't. I mean, and and that's that's a I'm putting that charitably. So, and at the same time, there is a, there is a supply problem. You would imagine that if this is the case, you have, like, you know, it's an oversupply problem. But the problem is there on the other side as well. Companies can't find people to hire. Salaries are going up. Uh, you know, join sign-in bonuses are going up. Referral bonuses are going up. So, <clears throat> with, with so much material, right, so many good courses online, so much open source code, so many events like this that can be attended, and so many opportunities for people to learn and upskill. At the same time, you know, this kind of mess happening in the industry. Like, do you do you have any thoughts on that? Like, you want to square those two? Like, this. Yeah, I think Sri Ram is just eager to jump in. Yeah. Pramod, you I, mean, I just wanted to ask you yeah, also, yeah. yeah, because you've been yeah. in that space, right, specifically? Yeah. Uh, I believe the problem is basically cultural, mostly. Now, education, uh, in, at least in India, is mostly teacher-driven. So once you end up pursuing a, say, engineering degree, what really happens is uh, ultimately what counts in the end is your uh, grade. How much marks do you score? What is your grade? So you're forced to mug up things. You're forced to spend most of your time doing things which have very little value. And uh, the teachers on their part uh, do very little to make students aware of the wealth of material available outside of the whatever the prescribed uh, boundaries of the syllabus. So I, I, what I feel is that the basic issue is uh, mostly this cultural problem, people not being aware of these things uh, and uh, education being driven mostly, uh, education being thought of mostly as a process of uh, learning things just to score marks. So once uh, people get out of that framework, uh, once uh, students are made aware of these things and they're uh, encouraged to pursue these things, I feel that the situation will improve. That's what I personally feel. So the two quick comments I want to make. One is, you know, whenever I do visit, whenever I visit India, I try to visit like the local colleges, right? Like, because those are the ones that don't get visitors as often, right? Like IITs get their share of visitors. They don't need any more visitors. And it's, you know, it's a frustrating experience because everybody is just so damn reverent, right? Like everyone's like afraid of stepping outside the boundaries, stepping outside the boxes. And so like, you know, so Nufal said, look, look at all this. There's all this amazing material. But to approach, to grab that material, you have to have a certain degree of irreverence, right? This is echoing what Pramod said, right? So, so the, the, the uncharitable view is that the students are, you know, they, 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 they only want to do what the, what the professor wants them to do because they want the grades. But the more charitable view to the students is they have to get a culture where they can just go out and reach out and take something else and not be penalized by their instructor for reaching out and getting something else. Right. So there's a whole sort of cultural thing over there that, as, as Pramod said, but but I want to respond a little bit, Nufal, to what you said about all this material. Right. Again, pardon me for being the re voice of research here, but we have really good research now on how MOOCs worked out. OK. And I think it's really relevant to the point you just made. So we've now had several years of very good studies on studying what happened to the MOOC phenomenon, which in the U.S. at least started about 2012. Starting about 2015, we started to get the research results. And what they basically show is MOOCs are a great mechanism for the rich to get richer. Right? It's a classic Matthew effect because the pe a lot of people succeeded with MOOCs. The people who succeeded were invariably people who already had a bachelor's degree, often a high quality bachelor's degree, and they were trying to advance themselves or they had a master's or something like that, right? So they already had all of the learning skills and all of the, the self-regulatory skills that are needed to get a good education, right? I, I mean, ever since I read that literature, I realized one of the things we do as professors, one of the main contributions we do is actually not my brilliance and not my genius, not all the other things that I think I'm endowed with. It's actually setting a calendar of assignments for my students. If I leave them to themselves, there's two million things they could be doing, and they're going to jump around from dart from one thing to the other. What I do is I say, I will figure out a path of knowledge for you. I will carve it down for you, and I will schedule you. And I'll tell you, this is going to take three days, and that's going to take seven days. 
that is actually the single most valuable thing I do as an educator, right? That self-regulation is very hard to achieve. And these resources are great. I mean, it, the, the MOOCs were always marketed with, there was a boy in Peru, there was this one girl in Pakistan. Yes, but they're one out of a billion, right? On the planetary scale, right? And, and we let these people get away with this bullshit and it's just nonsense. It's complete nonsense, right? So the people who are at PyCon are again, that sort of that quote unquote elite. They have the motivation to stay up on a Saturday evening, right? They're not out at a bar or whatever they could be. They're here trying to learn. Right? They're already set themselves apart as a kind of elite. Right? So the problem is all this material exists. In fact, the more material there is, the harder it is for a self-learner to get started because now you have the problem of choice. Right? So, so I just want to moderate that comment about the material to say the material's there, the people are there, but there's actually a non-trivial pipeline problem between those two. Yeah, I think I, I take your point. I mean, that, that's that's very valid. And uh, it's something that has come up as well. And also what Pramod and Ambika said, I mean, in, in the Indian context, there is no better way to kill interest in a student than to make the subject compulsory. Like a lot of kids who do martial arts and who enjoy it. But once you make it a subject in school and you are graded for it, you have grace marks and all of that, that's the end of that. So, I mean, so, that, that's there. I just have a few things to say about, I mean, I'm, I'm going to refer back to the previous please, question please. as well. Uh, I started late too. I mean, I did biology. I didn't want to do CS in school because I liked biology. I wanted the option, at least as a card to play. Um, I started late and when I was an undergrad, I basically said, look, computer science, ah, it's like a calculator. That was my attitude. I started off there and then I picked it up. Um, and I honestly feel that that's how it should be. I mean, you want to do something, you do it. And kids should be encouraged to do exactly what they want. So, for example, I'm going to pick something completely different, which is music. If you look at someone who's trying to make it big in music, in Carnatic music, for example, they have to start really young. So they start young, they'll be sitting and playing, practicing day in, day out. That's what it takes. So it's uh, so it's not an it's a choice. I think programming is a choice. So if you, but if you choose to take something in the science engineering domain, it helps to know it. That's you know, but I'm going to push I, back against that a little bit, Prabhu. So sure. yes, that is true. Absolutely right. Like, you know, if you impose something on people, they don't want to do it. You leave them the choice. The difficulty is um, that choice is not actually a free choice because it's tied up in so many other issues of identity and society and social sure. pressures and availability. That's sure. the place where, so that is actually the argument that people make in pu for pushing for required computer science courses. Right. And and so our approach and the bootstrap approach is to say, no, no, we're not going to require it. We're going to take existing required courses and weave it in there, because then at least we haven't ruined computer science for that kid, even if other things have been ruined for that kid. Right. But that's the only subtle thing is like it's it's, you know, for me growing up middle class in India, it was sort of accessibility to computing and the idea that I might want to reach out for it is a very different experience than, you know, a bunch of other people. That, that's that's the only pushback. Sure. So I completely agree. And the reason I was trying to say this was just that the other problem is way too big for this panel to even. I don't think we, I don't think we even know the answers. Right? I mean, how is it that we're going to tackle these uh, non-trivial issues about skill? I mean, the same. And this is not true uh, just in the non-elite colleges. Even here, you see in an IIT, you're going to find students who just can't program. You're going to find students who can't even think uh, straight. You know, it's, you're going to find them. And how do you deal with that? It's it's a non-trivial problem. And I don't have the answer. Because it's a lot of resources. Um, there are lots of social issues. There are lots of economic issues at, at play. There are issues of students having, you know, uh, emotional problems. There are people who come here because they think this is the last resort. They, this is their this is their gateway ticket to, you know, get something fantastic. So the the it, nothing is aligned, right? It's not like here's a goal and I want to approach it. Then it's all straightforward. The problem is in life that's not the case, and that reality is way too complex for us to talk about in this context. So all I'm saying is, uh, I don't see a a major deal with it being either one way or the other. If someone's smart enough, uh, they have the access. I agree, access is a, not a choice. It's not a free choice sometimes. Uh, but given a, the fact that a lot of this is actually available free, uh, modulo the fact that you have a internet connection, right? So uh, subject to that, things are available. It's not as if it's locked up in some place and you cannot access it. That's that's the big difference I see with computer science vis-a-vis uh, you know, getting into a specific educational institution or getting a job. That's a kind of different uh, kettle of fish, right? Uh, 
So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say that very often in the Indian mindset, uh, things become too predetermined. Things become, oh, you have to do X, Y, Z if you have to do this. I'm just saying that that's not the case, and I, I don't advocate for that. That's, that's really what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think your point is, uh, it, it resonates probably. I mean, uh, all, all other things, you know, notwithstanding, there are more self-made programmers than there are, say, self-made mechanical engineers or self-made... Uh, other things that's probably one other way of looking at it but i think we've we can probably start taking questions from the audience right now i think we have a rough idea of where everyone is and stuff i was just looking through the questions the first one that came is is the video working so i don't think that's that's really something which we need to answer over here but yeah uh let's just see um so let me just look at this uh So yeah, do I'm comments. I'm sorry. That where are you looking? Is this a place we can look as well, or no? Uh, I I don't know if you see the same thing as me, but if you okay. take the there's the private chat comments tabs on the right of the ah, 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 in the comments tab. Comments. Okay, okay. The comments. Got it. Got it. Thanks. So I see two th two comments over there, which can sort of be construed as a question. We'll start with that, perhaps. One is schools teach you to follow Shinto CV says schools teaches you to follow creativity. Individuality is discouraged. And a follow-up sort of is uh, all they want marks. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So I, I wanted to, so, I mean, I remember reading this myself, like, you know, the marks are used to measure the student, uh, you know, to uh, evaluate, I mean, to measure the quality of the student, measure the, uh, how much they've understood of what, what of the subject and as a measure of the metric of how good the school is. And these three things are not exactly aligned. So you tend to play games over there. So maybe you so, can comment on that. Sorry, Nofal, there was a question that, uh, nice question before this uh, by Rahul Kumarasan. Is starting with computer literacy okay. becoming a gatekeeper in different settings? Uh, that was a- Oh, I think I missed that. Okay, I think, yeah, we should start with that then. Okay. Yes, definitely. That's, that's, that's good. Yes. Let me just- uh, yeah. Uh, go, go ahead, Prabhu. You got to start it. Get, go, give us an answer. Yeah. <laughs> I was just bringing it up to the panel. Okay. Um, oh, you, you touch yeah, it. I don't you know. It. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I, um, it does become a, a gatekeeper because, again, the way I see it is it's like anything else, right? So if you come into a, a if you're a singer, I'm going to pick the singing theme because it matches really well here. If you're a singer and you're bound into a family of singers, you have a big leg up, right? As in, the, you start off when you're five, you can identify all these ragas, you can go to hundreds of concerts, you've picked up all of these things. And now, you you know, you have that thing in your, your brain is swimming with music, right? So yes, I mean, it, uh, I think that's like by definition, each of these, you start earlier, you're better at it. Um, you have more more of the 10,000 hours that you make up. And then you get to a point where you're an expert and you can, you can beat everybody else who's not had that leg up. And if you have a genetic advantage, even better. So there are lots of these, uh, uh, these things necessarily become gatekeepers, but uh, I, maybe you're asking a more deep question, uh, as in, uh, so, so the only way I can possibly answer the question is, well, uh, if I see it as certain things I cannot do, uh, uh, that is a problem, used to be a problem in India. Uh, for example, if you do a commerce course uh, and you have no background in science, you can't take a whole bunch of jobs. You can't in the past. I don't know what it is right now. So that is definitely a gatekeeper. Um, uh, for example, you have a commerce degree. You can't get into a, a IIT. Well, you can write the gate, I think. Right. So there are there are some of these things become gatekeepers. Yes. So yes, it could be, but I don't know how bad it is. Ambika, I'd love to hear your perspective on this, given that you're sort of a little, uh, you know, you're, you mentioned you've been doing this for fewer years. You started as an adult. How does the whole gatekeeping question feel to you? So, I mean, I would firstly see Kuma, Rahul's question more about literacy, which perhaps is not the same as knowing programming or coding or understanding computational thinking. Uh, and uh, my like the a very interesting anecdote came to my mind. My uh, mother-in-law, who is now a retired railway uh, in the, from retired from the railways, uh, spoke to her not retired uh, staff team member who told them that for every new computer that comes into the into the office, four people have to be let go. 
so so uh, so like this equation of this uh, machine versus person is is so at this larger level and then there's the uh, your idea of literacy and then there's the idea of learning com computation thinking and cs and then uh, i look at it from the other perspective and now i see as a designer and a maker knowing coding has given me a new tool uh, to speak to a new uh, cohort of people so earlier i would draw and i would take it to the carpenter today i can make a code sketch on processing or p5js and i can take it to a person who's much better at coding and help them uh, visualize uh, visualize it and inversely what i see a lot in terms of the people who come into my streams and 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 my uh, teaching sessions i see a lot of people who are much better at coding than me come into those spaces it's uh, because uh, i feel that generationally there is now a sense that people want to do things that help them feel emancipated uh, and i think a key aspect to that uh, in their minds uh, seems to be something creative something to do with being a maker uh you know whether it's as simple as a young person saying i want to be a youtuber right so they see that okay this is my uh, cs uh, education which i did for 4 years which i have to continue doing as a web developer in xyz company uh, but in my spare time i really like to see how i can uh, take all of that mathematical and, and analytical knowledge that i have and create something beautiful and i'm beautiful i mean just purely aesthetic so uh, so those are aspects and i see that uh, you know many of them are now trying to come into the creative sector they want to be part of design agencies they, they don't any more want to join the big cognizance and and whatever else of those i don't know the names to well uh, and they want to join us as a small organization and they they're really good at what they do but they want to now contribute in a very different way uh, towards the economy and towards you know what they're doing with with their own lives so perhaps uh, i mean i mean there are many layers to this uh, and and i think li I mean, literacy maybe uh, rahul me meant it more in terms of uh, knowing coding uh, but i think it's now it's now for all of us a time to be able to explore all of this as intersectionally as possible because uh, that's the way to go i mean uh, my, you may you guys may know maybe prabhu there's a uh, artist called tom sacks his entire work is around aerospace he rebuilds entire uh, spaceship models he rebuilds the surfaces of the moon with plywood and with glue so uh, you know so and with paint so so i mean it's it's like a matter of all, and many times we do work with people who are extremely technical in stem and extremely technical in building so like how do you bring all of those things together how do you bring uh, a person who's doing who's a really good av uh, technician and and technologist and bring it with a person who's a third generation miniature artist how do you bring a musician uh, who's a carnatic musician and and bring them to an algorithm which is like a coding plus uh, music based generative format so these are th these are questions that come to us in 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 our creative sector uh, and that's why many of us uh, at even at a later age are rushing now to learn the ideas of computational thinking and and we keep that as the base that we need to learn the idea we don't need to learn hello world you don't need to know print you know brackets uh, quotes and hello world you just need to understand how the systems work that that is important for us in at least in in the spaces that we are in though i will say a lot of what we do in in response to this claim that everyone needs no computational thinking it is not clear to me teaches any computational thinking right two weeks of programming in scratch doesn't teach you darn thing about computational thinking so so i i the, the phrase computational thinking really irks me by the way just so you know because it's based yeah but on... maybe shiram it irks you because you you already have a sense of it no no you didn't let me say in... why you didn't let me say why <laughs> it's based on a false premise it is based on an assumption on on the single most invalid assumption in all of education right if you read janet wing's article for example it's actually better than most of its successors right um she makes an argument she says look there's two kinds of computational thinking basically there's computational thinking where we apply computing in the sciences okay that's actually not a new idea right any act the first computer was built to launch missiles right so we've been doing differential equations on computers literally from day one okay but then she talks about the other the profound kind of computational thinking right if you know how to do x you'll know how to do y right if you learn queuing theory you'll know how to pick lines in the supermarket if you need to pack your backpack bin packing problems okay and that is a very profound idea that's the actual interesting idea okay and that is an idea that education researchers call transfer and the most robust research we have in education says transfer does not exist it does not work unless you really 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 explicitly build towards it 
right? And so, so my point is not that is there is there such a thing as computational thinking? Probably there may be some construct there, but a if we don't teach for transfer, we're not getting any of that, and b. If we don't, um, if all we do is like two weeks of scratch and say scratch equals computational thinking, we're not getting that either, right? So the problem is a lot of really, really bogus stuff hides under this phrase, which is why I dislike the phrase. It's been used as a cover for all kinds of bogus stuff. That's my real point. But that's really? the whole yeah. that's the whole idea that like you take a premise and you don't have to necessarily stick to the the ideas that and assumptions that are coming in from some theory. Like for me, computational thinking doesn't mean bin, bin theory or Turing or whatever. For me, it means being able to put my thoughts and ideas in a way that I was not able to in the past. You know, uh, in the past as a designer, I'm I'm trained in a certain way. You know, I, I observe the world in a certain way. Uh, and and my observation in the in the shopping line is is not going to be how many people there are. I'm observing their shoes. I'm observing uh, what they're doing with their hands. I'm observing how they're holding things. So you suddenly, sound like a great designer. I don't know where the computation part comes into that. <laughs> yeah, but, but that, the point is, is the computational I mean, part was meant to be something more than that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it was. But that's what I'm saying. That why do we need to? If if we are able to think about all of this intersectionally, and if you and I are on the same platform, then why must we? Continue to think about computational thinking in terms of Jeanette Wing. I'm sorry, you know, I may not know the name correctly, but but that's the whole idea. That if if you're saying that people are coming into this pan, uh, to listen to us and they know that I am not from a CS background, then I think it's for for us to look at these spaces totally differently. Why do we need to be stuck in these ideas of what CS can give us and what it can't give us? I mean, it can make me a better designer. Nobody would have thought of that five years ago. Even even now, my mother, who's a designer, tells me, "What are you doing with this code?" Right? Uh, it's the same way. If so someone was, you know, she's like, "Pata nahi kuch coding karti hai." That's how she tells people about me, you know. And and uh, if I told her that I was a designer and I do branding, and it, she would be able to pinpoint and exactly tell people what I do. So uh, so I think like it's about. Us trying to move away from that, and perhaps in the Western education system, you do get that chance. But here, even if I'm in a design school, I never get the chance of thinking of myself as being, uh, being a, being in development. And if I'm a develop in in, in development or coding, I never get the chance of thinking of myself as an artist or a creator. So I think it's it's for us to be uh, in our spaces to be able to move those ideas in young people's minds. So just to clarify, right, because I started this thing with computational thinking, this want to be very clear. See, if you actually take, if I if I want to engage you on that, I'll say computer science is bogus. It's all mathematics, right? So the, the point is, it's not about uh, uh, it's not about the specific words that I use. What I'm trying to say is, it really really helps if you know how to use a computer and program. That requires two things. It needs you to learn some programming language. I don't care what it is. It doesn't have to be Python. It can be Java. It can be Pyrite. It can be anything. It is. And it also requires how to think like a computer. Yeah, Prabhu, sorry. can I interject? Because there's a question that's come up that speaks exactly to the point you're making. One of them, uh, Rahul just posted this on the private chat. Most programmers don't understand the first principles of CS. They'd rather jump directly into making applications. How do you encourage people to go to the lower abstraction levels? So I think that theory versus building stuff tension is always there. So. I mean, I, I just wanted to bring that up so that you can weave that sure. also into your so, if it's so, relevant. So, you know, my, I, I absolutely agree with you. A lot of these terms, like data science, right? You know, I, I also cringe a little bit when someone says that. It's like, what's the science in data? You know, there, there's a lot of these things that are terms that we use to speak colloquially, but it's not precisely defined, and then it sort of irritates someone or the other, right? So my intention was not to irritate you on that. It's just about, uh, I see it as a tool. As an engineer, maybe that's my training. I see it as a tool, and I suspect Ambika sees it the same way. And I think it's an enabling tool, and I see no harm. But, but Prabhu, I think the problem is there's at least three different things here, right? There's sure. computers, there's yes. computing, and there's computational thinking. Yes. Okay, and if we conflate all of those, which we've just done, none of these words mean anything anymore, and people are going to very comfortably talk past each other, right? I mean, there are like somebody said in the chat. Okay, make sure they don't learn anything about Excel, right? Well. Is Excel part of computational thinking? Is it part of computers? Is it part of computing? If we use all the same words to mean all of the things we want whenever it's convenient, so if if the words don't mean anything, why use the phrase at all, 
right well then like, you have to talk but wasn't the word class. wasn't the term computer first used for the women who worked in uh, in uh, sure in and a, that meaning in, has shifted anatomical okay yeah i mean it, it, so it then, we're so not then just an article thinking can shift as a meaning right you you, you, you can so? and so let's agree then that we don't mean what most people who actually study the term and research the term mean right well i guess I mean, then that is an entire the body of work that right. studies and studies this term and investigates the term look when when people say i want to understand where the computational thinking happened they need a construct that they're trying to measure right if we let that construct mean anything we want then it's kind of trivial to measure it right it's like did anyone did a computer get turned on yes computational thinking happened right why do we want to use the word thinking thinking implies like some higher skill so if we want to talk about low level skills which is the question here in the file you point out that uh, what got posted here right well we want to use the word thinking well why do we want to wrap ourselves in this wonderful glorious term if we don't want it to mean anything right we've got to like have a meaning for the constructs we use so we can talk about if we want to measure it i don't mean measure in like numerically but evaluate in any way like ask about success or failure we got to know what it is we're even talking about sure so why don't you define the term then we'll agree we'll agree with oh you. i don't even it's like the term so i don't care about the term i'm just saying like the term as has, sure. as people typically use it has sure. to do with transfer so do right? you have a it, more precise term is my question to you it, it has to do with transfer computational thinking seems to be centrally around the notion of transfer okay the idea of you learn like why should we teach computational thinking a common argument is if people learn computational thinking they will be able to do other things better and the other means implicitly means transfer right that's what the other part means so so it's beneficial because it has some broader benefits beyond just the ability to write a program right that has been like a central idea to almost all of these definitions for a very long time and in fact people sometimes distinguish say computational thinking versus say algorithmic thinking to say sort of algorithmic thinking is more inward looking computational thinking is this more outward looking idea right i don't actually care for these definitional games i'm just saying there's at a very high level if you just like the top 30000 foot view there's a notion of transfer and that's what that term seems to associate with right So if we don't want to use it we can use another term otherwise we imply transfer and then we have to be careful because somebody listening who knows that definition is going to think oh you think if x happens y happens when in fact that's not what you meant that's it so i i have a small comment over there that might uh, clarify the point which is that uh, uh, there's a friend of mine here who's a neurosurgeon he's like a doctor as a medical doctor but he's also a programmer in his free time and he has like a couple of apps on app store and he's quite reputed in that area as well so i recommended him to a friend of mine because he wanted to you know visit him for his mother or something and he went there and my friend is a programmer he spoke to the doctor for 10 minutes and he came back to me and says oh no that guy is speaking like a programmer because he's trying to sort of he's trying to ask specific questions and debug this guy's mother and uh, that that was sort of i mean it it sort of you know lit a bulb i mean like this that 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 method of thinking is something that i mean it it changes the way you look at things in some sense if you do this for long enough i can say that about anything but maybe that's the thing that we're trying to teach in the first place i don't know and if it is we're not accomplishing your two weeks of scratch right so this is this oh, yeah. yeah i can, I can uh, see one shift here yeah Oh, sorry pramod go on yeah. i can see one uh, comment here by anubhav now he has mentioned a course called uh, build a computer now one of the fascinating things i find about uh, computing is you can start from very simple abstractions you keep uh, building layer upon layer upon layer upon abstraction and ultimately you reach uh, something really complex now there's a course called uh, nant to tetris uh, if you do a google search you can see that uh this course will teach you how to start with a simple nand gate then build more uh, complex combinational sequential circuits build a simple cpu write a small assembler for that write a small programming language compiler create a small operating system write a small application program it's an amazing course and uh, if there are any students uh, listening to this i feel that they should uh, try it out uh i think that 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 course is uh, i i a small plug i think the person when he uh, talked gave a ted talk about that course he specifically mentioned promote in the ted talk yeah, because yeah. of promote work on that so i'd like yeah. to mention that as well 
but I think let's let's shift a little bit more into the practical side of things. Right? There's a bunch of questions that's been coming up for that. So uh, one of them is this. Uh, so I'll just mention a few of the questions that should give us a meta question that should help us. While doing my CSB tech, I hated mugging all the theory, but I only but I only knew that mode of learning. Once I started writing code, I enjoyed the process. So the coding aspect of this. Then uh, there was Rahul's Rahul post another question. What's the fix for the problem where middle class parents who want to teach their kids coding but not the redacted way? Then. Uh, Mm, yeah, what, is your, what are your views on pushing force into education? So these are all some of the more practical aspects of actually teaching something to students and how to do it, what to teach. So I think that, that would cover a bunch of questions which a lot of them have been asked. Maybe we can take those. What to teach and how to teach it, rather than just the definition. I'd like to hear Pramod's views on this. Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Uh, at least from the perspective of uh, undergraduate uh, computer science uh, education. Uh, right now, what we have is uh, we have a four year course. And in this course, we have got uh, two projects, a mini project and a main project coming in the third year and the fourth year. And these are the only two contexts where uh, students uh, gain at least some hands on uh, uh, practice with programming. So, what I feel is that maybe something very simple, uh, make it compulsory to have uh, one project uh, every semester as part of the curriculum so that uh, students get a chance to apply their uh, coding skills, number one. Number two, uh, there was one comment on pushing force uh, in computer science education. I feel that uh, still there are a lot of uh, universities uh, in India, colleges where they are uh, using Windows machines and old uh, Turbo C compilers. Uh, so just shifting over to uh, using Linux, that will uh, by itself uh, create a lot of uh, change, um, improvement in the standards of the students. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Change and improvement are two totally different things. Sorry. This, 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 uh, look, I know I'm wandering into the, the nest of vipers here by taking on the FOSS. People, <laughs> okay. FOSS is a mechanism, it's a means to an end. Until you've described the end, you can't talk about the means. Is FOSS useful? Maybe. Could it be a step backward? Maybe. If you have a curriculum that is completely centered around audio and video, maybe Linux is not the best way to go, right? So far, the only reliable place we have like audio and video working in Linux is like on Mars or something like that, right? So if you're going to spend all of your time messing around device drivers, maybe that's not the right way to go. So I, I think we have to be careful of these statements, right? Like, yes, is it valuable? Of course. Do we have uses for it? Tons of uses. But simply shifting a college from like Windows to Linux is not necessarily solving any problems. It might introduce a whole bunch too. Actually, I, I think that's not quite right. I think that's a, see, if you take, uh, let, me, let me give you a very simple example. The state of affairs here is such that most people pirate software. I don't think that's a good thing to do. So do you want someone to shell out 2,500 rupees to buy an operating system? and not own a computer, or would you like them to have a computer that they can actually use and do something useful, whether or not they can play that MP3 or that AAC file or something. So I, I Are the people with that, the pirated things not doing anything useful? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that are you encouraging piracy in that case? So it doesn't, so I'm just saying that yes, it is a useful tool. I agree with you that it's a useful tool. And I agree with you that uh, just because you switch too fast doesn't make you suddenly, you know, uh, but I don't think there is necessarily uh, anything bad about encouraging people to use free and open source software. A lot of people don't even realize of the existence of, oh, there's these nice free packages. That That's I a very do. different point though, right? That's not I what I was pushing you. back against. Sure, sure, yeah. I agree with you. But I, I think there is value in using FOSS, especially in the Indian context, because the numbers are really hard. They're really, really hard. Because yeah. I remember when I was a grad student and I'm not somebody who's not, who, I have a lot more privilege than many other people. I couldn't buy a textbook, costed $60. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. buy a textbook. So what do you expect me to do? So I'm not going to buy the argument that, you know, just because it's commercial, it's good or bad. I think the FOSS has a huge role to play in, in, in the country. I think that's that's not something that, uh, um, I know you know, I don't, I, I know you're not disagreeing with that. I know you know it's an enabler, but I think it's a significant factor in the Indian context. Look, I, think I may or may not have pirated various things in my childhood as well, right? 
Um, and all of my books are free and online for precisely that reason. I got MIT Press to shift to making their books available for free, right? So I'm a huge believer in the concept of, of the accessibility of knowledge is like a huge big thing. And growing up in India is what taught me that. So I completely get that. I just want to push back against like a claim, a blanket claim, like shifting to FOSS is somehow going to make anything better, right? When it could even make things worse. Sure. Uh, I, think, anything, I, think, right? I can say anything, yeah. right? Is you can anything brought to an extreme is obviously not a good idea. I'm not, I'm, no one's advocating an extreme. It's just that in a limited context, and clearly this context is not a global context. This is a context very specific to India. This is Pycon India, and I think it's it's important because uh, you know a lot of people have. I mean, Pramod himself, right? I think there are lots of things that have happened for him because he was on the first platform, certain users, and that's why. Uh, that there is sense. something about a community. There is something about a community. You can't take that away. The fact that I started contributing to open source was because I wanted to give back. And that's a huge deal. It's not, it's not something that's like, uh, look, I, 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 I'm not going to have that same degree of engagement with anything else but something like a community. So a community is a major player here. So I don't think uh, it's just an argument of, oh, you do fast, you're going to solve the problem. I don't think anything is like that, right? I don't think any solution anyone is ever going to offer is ever going to be something like I do this and I immediately get a solution. That's never going to happen. So it's a matter of you know uh, positioning things in a in, in an environment in a given context in which terms are understood or the situation is understood in which you're placing something. So that, that's you know that's what I I, I think uh, I'm pushing back a little bit on what you're saying, but I completely agree with you that it's not a blanket. No, know, I I, 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 get, I get your point. I get your point. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're all open source developers here, right? So it's not like I'm not here trying to make a place for core, core, closed source systems. Um, yes, yes. Totally. I'm, I'm reacting I'm to a specific that. remark. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I totally uh, agree. I, I, and I, I also am not on the other extreme saying, look, everything has to be FOSS. If not, it's evil. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there is a clear role that FOSS does have to play. And it's a significant role in India, given the uh, financial, economic, a whole bunch of other things. And the fact that I can learn. It's a, it was an eye-opener for me when I first got my Red Hat in that city. I could go look around, root around, and I saw so many programs. And I'm like, wow, this is a universe I never thought about. I didn't even know about it. So it's 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 huge. And the fact that it's available, it's on a CD, it's on your own computer. I don't have to go root around on the internet to find it. That's a big deal. And I think, at least for the curious yeah, ones amongst us, it's like, a, it's like I'm a kid in a candy store, right? So, uh, yeah. I think Sorry. Sriram, there was also there's a there's a, a unspoken aspect to that. I mean, there's there's a lot of proprietary software that's being used only in Indian colleges, right? Like Turbo C. You won't find Turbo C anywhere except in Indian engineering colleges, right? It'll be running inside DOSBox, maybe on Ubuntu, and yeah. that's where see, people see, do their code. Okay, but the problem, no, no. So so the, this is great. Now I've got like '80s flashbacks, um, but. See, Nafal, I think the problem that, so yes, that's a very interesting point. And I think what we may be doing is then conflating issues, right? The question is, why the hell is anybody using Turbo C in 2021, right? And, and you know, I, as I said, I, when I visit Indian colleges, this is all actually, as I said, it's a frustrating experience because I feel like I'm in this time warp, right? Like, what do you, why are you people still talking about this stuff? Surely this can't be what you're still talking about. Right. And so the problem there is more, I would say, the time warp rather than the Turbo C and the fact that Turbo C is commercial and like getting to the root cause. The root cause is the time warp. Right. And if it's not Turbo C, they could look for all, you know, these people would use 80s like, you know, GCC from 1985 as well. Right. Like that's not going to solve the problem. They're still using a curriculum from 1985. And so I think that's why I want to sort of separate out these issues a little bit. Sure. Um, Absolutely, I, I I really appreciate your you know your, your I can see you're trying to abstract the discussions here, but uh, I I'd like is, to okay, sorry can yeah. I add something to this please, sorry please, please. Uh, now uh, I have a few points I think the most interesting aspect of uh, your conversations around FOSS firstly uh, in India the design uh, curriculum was from the 60s so we are even more dated than most technologists uh, but coming in from this aspect uh, of having to specifically for design having to use a uh, closed source software because everyone knows that eventually all designers have to use the Apple and all the software that comes with it. Uh, and in general, one one knows that it is built towards a productivity that we require as, as designers. Uh, and then, of course, as he said, the drivers and whatever. And, and I'm trying to use Linux and I'm always failing. So in that context, 
uh, i think the interesting thing that prabhu also mentioned but perhaps not explicitly so is that the key learning for any commun any person is coming through community and i think all of us have experienced that in whatever community we have and if we are learning through an open uh, a community that's basing itself on values of being open and and you know like contribution it is so much better uh, compared to uh, working in uh, you know uh, adobe or whatever other kind of software that Uh, we end up using as designers and then not having that value inside my own you know inside my own being to be you know be helpful to be contributing to be uh, you know have these soft values towards others within my community and be competitive and you know unrealistic about about other people's feelings so i think that's very interesting and p- perhaps not explicitly stated but uh, and i think uh, shiram i'm sure you you would know that Stephen Hani and Fred Morton speak about learning within the university, but within your un- unofficial spaces. So I mean, I'm very like roughly paraphrasing, but but that is where for me uh, I find that that's where key learning is. It's not through us as being, uh, you know, teachers giving gyan like this from our head, but from the from the networks internally uh, who are like building it together and challenging us as. perhaps in this sense teachers or, or facilitators to to do something which is larger perhaps i mean look fast has the potential to revolutionize our indian education right like you have the ability to go directly to the students right i mean this was the this is the idea behind the the freedom toaster right is the 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 uh uh what's his name shuttleworth's idea right there'd be this box you could go and you could get a cd you plug it in so you could sort of sprinkle cd's from the air so to speak right get everybody a uh, student using this at home and then going to that teacher and saying like hey why aren't we doing more of this in the school if i can do this at home why can't we do this at school right but the other problem there the other root cause there is the freedom to go to the teacher first of all the courage to go to the teacher and ask that question and secondly the teacher to have the courage to say huh that's a good idea as opposed to like you know you need to know your place right and so i think this is where the prominence of people like pramod right who's now sort of very well known is useful because now it's not like me saying it it's promotes are saying it right so you put the blame on somebody else you need other people to blame right and pramod can take the blame so that other students can feel empowered to go out and say this i think that is a is a an absolutely essential change that needs to happen and it also feeds into your earlier point of this irreverence right the, so you have now an environment saying i'm not going to use turbo c i'm going to use gcc for whatever it is i mean it, it there is this uh, undercurrent of that as well so Yeah and that also suggests the marketing approach here right is to tell students look you can be a rebel right and write the same code but we'll help we'll help each other show you how to use this other environment that may be like more difficult to use give depending on what your background is but we can help each other right and that's where the pointed 5 minute video right telling students there's an entire course online that's not going to work right telling students there's a 5 minute video that shows you how you can take your code for this college right and make it work under gcc instead and you can still write your solution and turn it in and your teacher wouldn't know any better that video is immensely valuable that's like infinitely valuable relative to like the course that's online right now uh, because it's pointed help right and having that revolution work would be great because that could be the starting point for students taking more ownership back of their education like we all agree i think that clearly needs to happen right but like what's the easiest way to do that maybe that's the way the fast community needs to approach this uh there's a question that's come specifically for pramod which is how do you make sure that the mini projects which you said might you know stir this thing are not plagiarized and the student really learns something from the project this whole business of you know you can buy projects <laughs> Abs- absolutely no idea how that uh, that's a very tricky uh, i feel students have to be responsible there's no other way they should feel that they are doing these things for their own sake hmm other than that uh, i don't see i don't feel there is any solution plagiarism uh, is like the worst way we use our cycles as educators literally the worst possible way uh, my insight for this was you know we have a whole system at brown like if you can report you can write a report and it goes to some deans and what not and my colleague pointed out every one of those reports takes hours to write and that's hours spent on the student who wasn't willing to learn that you're not spending on the student who was willing to learn right so I think the be- like I've done a lot of research actually to try to work around this how can we change the way we do pedagogy so that plagiarism like encourage plagiarism so to speak right like 
you know, people copy, people copy from Stack Overflow, they copy from all over the place. How can we change computing pedagogy to take that into account and make it a positive and teach them something rather than like being always punitive, right? But you have to assume that there's some downstream effect of this plagiarism, right? They're going to show up for a job interview and not get a job, right? And if that doesn't happen, well, what are the job interviews doing? What's the degree doing? Then there's a much bigger systemic problem. If that does right. have a downstream effect, then promotes problem is taken care of, right? So, yeah, I like spinning cycles on plagiarism is like the worst thing we do as educators. Uh, I mean, this is this is like there's questions, a few more, but I think we have reached a time limit, so uh, I think we should wind up. Right? Uh, can can I? I think we can wind up by you know having a short. Uh, so a bit of practical advice from each one of you on this specific topic. We'll just go according to the uh, order on my screen. So, Sriram, you want to go? 30 seconds. I've Shoot. spoken enough. I'm going to give my, somebody else my time. Go. Pramod. You're muted, Pramod. I think you're muted. Yeah. yeah. For uh, students out there, this is the golden age of learning. You have uh, plenty of things out there to learn from. Uh, utilize that and uh, grow yourself professionally as well as... Uh, Personally, yeah. And um, Ambika, just have fun. Like, just be learning always. Don't worry about degrees and 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 jobs and and and. I know engineers also stress about a lot. Your students specifically about packages and stuff. Just don't stress about all that. Do do what you want to do. You want to become a you want to become a lawyer after this. Go ahead and do it. Like, just just do what you want to do. <laughs> so, uh, Prabhu. Yeah, my advice is, yeah, pick, figure out what you want to do and give it your all. That's, that's it. All right. I think uh, with that, we've uh, come to the end. I'd like to thank all our panelists, uh, uh, Professor Sriram, Pramod, Ambika, and Dr. Prabhu for your time and uh, for the audience for all the great questions and to the organizers of PyCon for handling such a large event, even in the middle of this kind of pandemic. Like, you know, it's phenomenal. So... Is this Thank event you so completely much. virtual or there's no physical presence yep. at all? No, no physical presence. All of us are in our bedroom, so yes. <laughs> that's where we are. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And, Thank uh, you so much. Nufal, yeah. thank you for the work you did yeah. to make this happen. You spent a ton of effort on this, so thanks. Oh, this, no, like, thank you. We had the easy thank job you. of just showing up and blathering on. So. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank, thank, you so much. much. Thank, thank you. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everyone, for such an amazing panel. Thank you. It was incredible to listen to. Bye, bro.